Just a short note uh, to say that uh, on the way that this was shot, uh, sleeping bags are difficult to display in person. Uh, they're challenging to photograph in still photography. And uh, when you start using video and introduce uh, an individual, a person, into the frame, uh, things get real wonky and you really can't see much of any, either the person or the sleeping bag. So I'm, I'm using some still photographs and doing some other things uh, in the future videos uh, to kind of improve the situation. Let me know what you think uh, in, the, uh, in the comments down below, um, if there's anything else, any other suggestions you may have. Howdy. Welcome back. Uh, this is the second uh, video in our series on early 20th century sleeping bags. Our previous video, uh, which will be linked to somewhere here on the screen, uh, YouTube will tell me where it goes, uh, talked about uh, one of the methods that was used to protect your sleeping bag from the rain uh, or dew or moisture, bird poop. Uh, and that came from an 1896 article in uh, Field and Stream. Uh, I'll show it here just briefly in case you didn't see the first video. Okay, now in that article, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, not only did they talk about the Stockman's bed sheet, but they also talked about using three pair of blankets. Now this does not mean you need six blankets like you would if you had six shoes making three pairs of shoes. Now paired blankets mean something else. This is what a paired blanket looks like. Now in case you didn't notice that's a mighty long blanket. Well, the reason why it's called a pair of blankets is it is two blankets long. It is just as wide as a regular blanket, but it is two blankets long. What that means is, is that when they unrolled it, they didn't cut it at every blanket length. They cut it every other blanket length. What you could do when you got home is you could fold it in half and cut it at the fold and make two blankets, or you could keep it that way. Now, during the late 19th, early 20th, and on into the middle of the 20th century, blankets like this were marketed in pairs. It was a cost-saving measure by the uh, manufacturer. Uh, if you had a roll of blankets that had just come off the mill, it was 20,000 blankets on that roll, well, you could save a little bit of money and time if you only made 10,000 cuts instead of 20,000. It's also a way to, to, to move merchandise. Uh, you know, you, it's a two-for-one sale, and everybody's seen a two-for-one sale. Here's an ad advertising paired blankets. As I said, you could leave that blanket that length if you wanted to, rather than cutting it and making two blankets, giving one to Tom and one to Sally. You could take that blanket and fold it in half and lay it on the bed and then get inside the folded blanket. And what this would do, it would ensure that your feet wouldn't stick out the end. Also, very, very useful if you're going to be making a homemade sleeping bag. Now, if you want to see a sleeping bag made out of three pair of blankets, here's what it looks like. Now, I could show you how I folded those blankets, uh, those three pairs of blankets to get that sleeping bag. But uh, first off, I, I, I can take them outside, lay them on the ground, and start folding. 
Uh, the problem with that is, is it you really won't see much of anything. And uh, I'd be too far away from the mic. I, I'd have to raise my voice. And, well, that would mean that, uh, you know, the neighbors would say, oh, what's that crazy old man up to this time? And then even if the mic did pick it up, most of what you'd hear is me huffing and puffing and grunting and stuff like that. And, and, and then for the rest of the video, all you'd hear from me is a complaint about my back. So instead, I think I've come up with a with a way that's a little bit easier on you and me. Uh, take a look and see what I've done. This will show you how to fold those blankets without all that other trouble. Here we have a blanket. The scale on this is one inch equals one foot, by the way. This blanket is 13 feet long by 6 feet wide. This blanket right here is 12 feet long by 6 feet wide and we lay it on top of this blanket just slightly off to the side. This is another blanket 6, inch, six feet by 12 feet and we lay it again slightly off to the side. We take our first blanket and fold it up so that it is even. We take our second blanket and fold it up even with the other one. And we take our longer blanket and fold it. And now what we've got is an envelope that is six feet about yeah, six foot eight. Then we fold it in half once again. You with me there? Then we take these folds that have been off to the side and fold them over. And this provides us with a side closure for the bag and we pin that up. Now, when we go to sleep, we can get inside the bag and we have this little flap right here to cover our heads. Now, you might want to remember that part about making that, that flap, that hood part at the top of the sleeping bag there, uh, it's going to come up in the future. Now, the reason why I made this video is that if you go to YouTube and you start looking around for homemade sleeping bags and early sleeping bags, what you're going to see is bushcraft videos and military reenactment videos showing you how to make a bedroll out of standard sized blankets and a small tarp. Okay, but a pair of blankets was a thing. It was a big thing, and it was mostly in the civilian world. You, you didn't hand out a pair of blankets to a soldier, although a soldier would be really happy if he got one. So if we're going to interpret the material culture of the time, uh, we should have a sprinkling, at least, uh, among our number of paired blankets, a pair of blankets, sleeping bags made out of a pair of blankets, or, or a bed uh, in the bottom of a tent, on the ground of a tent, made out of a pair of blankets, so that you can explain this practice to people. It's becoming lost knowledge. Now, as a living historian, uh, if you want to uh, replicate this, you could take some reproduction blankets or new production blankets and sew them down, sew them together lengthwise. And you could do this same kind of thing. A uh, couple drawbacks to that. Number one, you would probably need to use a serger to make sure that the seam is going to stick around. And number two, uh, it's cheaper to buy originals. 
Let me show you. Now to find these, your best source, of course, is going to be Evil Bay. And um, the search criteria I used to find them was camp blanket, extra long blanket, long blanket, paired blanket. And I was able to find them under all of those terms. Uh, one other note I will mention is that most of these blankets that are called camp blankets are actually a very lightweight wool or cotton flannel. Uh, and they were you designed to be used uh, camping in in uh, more temperate weather than and this it's not winter material, but it's good enough for camping out in in the woods in in August uh, through September and uh, you know into March and April. Okay, so the, the these first two videos in this series are were aimed more towards the living historian, the participant, uh, as a way to help them help you uh, improve your impression, or build one from scratch. Uh, in Bannerman's camp, uh, we generally focus a lot more on uh, reproduction military gear as sold in Bannerman's catalog during the late 19th and early 20th century. But we should have a mix of both that reproduction military gear and handmade gear like what we just saw in these net last two videos. Now, the next video is going to be aimed more towards the collector and the serious student of uh, outdoor products history. Uh, stick around. You might enjoy it.